So, hi, welcome everyone at this uh, last lecture by, uh, by Martijn Loos. Um, I don't know if you've read about the last lectures, but it's uh, something that Extra Muros and Studium Generale are organizing for several years now. But it's, been, it's inspired by a professor who, um, well, really had to give his le last lecture, and that became a very um, inspiring uh, last lecture. Also, you can find it on YouTube if you want. I forgot his name, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you can find it there. And it was his last lecture was about life and how you, um, um, well, how to deal with life and how to uh, go through life, etc. cetera. Um, today we have a last lecture by uh, Martijn. And so what we asked Martijn is, picture, if this was your last lecture, if you knew about it, maybe just because you were going on a on a huge trip around the world, or because huh, your your uh, it was really the la the last thing you could do, um, what was the what would be the thing that you want to tell everyone? What was the topic that you want to address, or that you say if if I have I can choose by myself because no there are no strings attached. I can just do what I want. What what should I talk about? And Martijn is going to talk about why you should read sci-fi and embrace your inner nerd. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing to think about what would I do if I uh, was asked this question to uh, give a last lecture. I wouldn't know it, but glad that you uh, came up with, uh, <laughs> with this uh, topic. And Martijn, maybe uh, we spoke about it. You can introduce yourself, I think that's, uh, and also by your, by your lecture. Uh, but we're very pleased that you're here. The floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Yes, so uh, as I was graciously introduced, I'm Martijn Loos. I'm a teaching assistant at the University College here at Tilburg University. Um, I will be speaking about why you should read sci-fi, because I find that very important, and concomitant to that, why you should embrace your inner nerd. But first, I want to start with a couple of uh, disclaimers. The first one is last lecture, right? I mean, this is barely my first, which means that I don't know either what I would want to speak about if, uh, if this were indeed my last. And so I, I picked a, a topic I'm passionate about. I figured that would be best. Next to that, I also want to stress that this is not my last lecture at all. I do not want to present myself as any sort of authority on the, uh, on the topic, right? I'm just mashing a couple of theories together about something I'm passionate about. And in that sense, hope to uh, well, hopefully inspire you a little bit. Second disclaimer is uh, I graduated a year ago from a, a comparative literary program in Utrecht which means that my field is mostly in literature and hence books. But um, that doesn't mean that um, sci-fi is limited to the, only that, of course. I'd also be using a lot of TV series and movies, but since my own field is mostly in literature, I'll be using that mostly. Right? So reading should also be taken more broadly than that. Right? The consumption of a, a movie is also reading in this sense. Uh, third disclaimer, science fiction is a very contentious uh, genre. Right? It's, it's a niche genre, it's genre fiction. Uh, there's a lot of nerds, right? which means that people can get very angry very fast about something they love a lot, yet at the same time is often ignored by right, more literary uh, critics or theorists or whatever. Right? So um, with that in mind, I do not want to get into one of those discussions on like, what is sci-fi exactly, what is it not. Right? You have these discussions on Reddit, they sometimes end up in death threats. And that's not what I want to be a part of. Um, so I will not exactly clear that up. I will define sci-fi in a way, but in, in, in a, with a diff slightly different angle. Because uh, I believe the genre can be a fickle thing, and that's a good thing. right? It should not be strictly defined in the first place, because then it loses a lot of the stuff that I will be talking about, I believe. And definitions can be ambiguous. In fact, I will be arguing for a certain potential of sci-fi that can shake loose definitions. And that is why I believe it is so awesome. right? So what will I do today? First, as said, I will look at what science fiction is, but I will focus on uh, what it does and why it does that. Instead of just saying, right, Star Wars is not science fiction and Star Trek is, right, yada, 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 the whole shebang. No, what does it do? What makes science fiction science fiction to me? And what does, it, what does that mean 
for the larger genre, right? Second, I'll be looking at uh, the novum, estrangement, critique, metaphor, and speculation. This is the dry theoretical part. I'll be using literary theory here and a little bit of philosophy, right? So if these terms don't mean a lot to you, that's great. I'll tell you. Um, and I'll be spicing that up with a lot of examples, hopefully, to take some of the inherent dryness out of it. Then I'll look at what I call the, the, the liberatory potential of science fiction, and that is why I believe you should read more sci-fi, but we'll get there, yeah? Secondly, you, right? Why you? What do you have to do with all this? So first thing, what is science fiction? Right? What is science fiction? Um, Adam Roberts is a, is a very respected uh, name in, the, in, the, in the, the, the scholarship, in the field of scholarship of science fiction. And he says that the term science fiction resists easy definition. This is a strange thing, because most people have a sense of what science fiction is. I think most of you will feel the same way in that sense. Right? So let's put that to the test for a little bit. Start, oh. Star Trek, the original series in this case. Is that, is that sci-fi? Yes. Yes? Any no's? All yeses? Oh, it's a tough crowd. Right? <laughs> Star Trek, sci-fi, yes or nay? Yes. yes. All right, good. Thank you very much. Gravity, 2003 film with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. Sci-fi, yay or nay? Yes. Yes? Okay, all right. Frankenstein, the original novel by Mary Shelley, 1818. Is that sci-fi, yay or nay? Yeah, all right, all right. 1984, George Orwell. Sci-fi? All right, we have some confusion uh, left and right. So I think that Adam Roberts, right, he, he, he's, he's, he hits uh, a certain nerve. He's correct about a certain thing. What is sci-fi? We don't know. We have a sort of instinctual feeling about it, perhaps, or, or a culturally <laughs> given feeling, more likely. But what exactly it is is a good question, right? So let's turn to, um, to the critics. Let's see what the critics say about sci-fi. Perhaps they can help us out in, in, in figuring out what makes sci-fi sci-fi. Uh, first definition is a man called Damien Knight, both a sci-fi author and a critic. He said, science fiction means what we point to when we say it. That's very lame, right? It's not useful critically either. This man can't help us, even though he writes sci-fi himself. Edward James, a scholar. Science fiction is what is marketed as sci-fi. Well, it's very cynical. Also lame, I would say, not very helpful either, right? Chuck Klosterman, cultural critic. Science fiction tends to be philosophy for stupid people. <laughs> um, yet Chuck Klosterman's own writing has been called in a review in The Guardian, reading for people who do not read, right? So this man is perhaps also not too useful. So the critics are not great. The critics are not great. They're not, they're not really helping us. Theorists, what about scholars of science fiction then? Can they help us perhaps? Eh? Who knows? So let's take a look at uh, Damien Broderick, who's a sort of father of modern uh, science fiction scholarship. And he says about science fiction, science fiction is that species of storytelling native to a culture undergoing the epistemic changes implicated in the rise and supersession of technical and industrial modes of production, distribution, consumption, and disposal. It is marked by metaphorical strategies and metonomic tactics, the foregrounding of icons and interpretive schemata from yada, 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 yada. That's not helpful either, right? It's way too convoluted. What does that say? It says so much it doesn't say anything. Which, funnily enough, we often see happening in sci-fi too, right? The flux capacitor, all that stuff. So theory is not very useful either, it seems. So who, who do we turn to? And I personally uh, turn to Darko Suvin who was a Croatian-born um, science fiction scholar, or came to, became a science fiction scholar over the year, I believe. Born in Zagreb, he um, emigrated to the States first and then to Canada after it. And in Canada, he became a professor in Montreal at McGill. And um, this, man, this is the kind of guy you need to turn to, right, when you talk about sci-fi, right? He, um, he looks at what does it do, right? And, and what is the thing that it does that makes it different from other genres? Right? And, and different from other modes of writing. And he points at what he calls the novum. The novum is the new thing, right, in a, in a science fiction story, the new thing that crystallizes the difference between the world of fiction and the real world outside. So he says there's a thing in science fiction, or multiple things, right? A single story can have multiple <coughs> nova that are new and make it different from the story we're reading and the world we're in on a daily basis. Or which I like to call, using Darko Suvin, 
an estranging yet plausible narrative mechanism grounded in materialism, most often based on science and technology. Uh, what does that mean? First of all, estranging is, is a strange word there. Suvin himself, he draws on Ernst Bloch, a Marxist scholar, and he uses estrangements in, in, in the sense of alienation or defamiliarization. We'll get back to that. That's very important, right? So it's estranging and plausible. Those are the two big terms right now that are important. So according to Suvin, this, this novum, this new thing, provides a point of difference from the real world and what we're reading or what we're watching, yeah? Robert, the man who at the very start gave us that quote about, uh, gave us that quote about uh, not being able to define sci-fi easily, right? That same man. Hence called science fiction the encounter with difference because of this thing called the novum, right? So some classic uh, nova in sci-fi are, for example, time travel, right? Faster than light interstellar travel, the alien, matter transportation, the robot, these sort of things. These are all classic nova in sci-fi. And so what do they do? They are estranging because they're not what we're used to in, in, in our daily lives, right? Yet they might be plausible. So they're weird, but potentially real at some point, somewhere, right? Do note that time travel invested in light interstellar travel, that's mostly Nova back from the 50s and the 60s, right? So yes, I know Einstein exists, but it's still classic Nova. Okay, that's cool. So we, we have this thing, we have a Novum, right? A, a thing that, that can help us define sci-fi as opposed to non-sci-fi, but also as opposed to uh, the real world. So, and that Novum is first of all, speculative, but plausible, right? It may be real. It's based on science and technology most often. And it is estranging, it is weird. Right? And so in that case, I would say Star Trek is full with Nova. Yeah? Chock full with Nova. And so you're right. According to this definition, the definition of Darko Suvin, Star Trek is very much science fiction. So it's 1984, right? Surveillance, double think, the whole shebang, those are Nova. They might be real, they might become real, yet they're still speculative. Well, so is Frankenstein, right? I think the estrangement part there is very good. Right? It's very, 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 very palpable, uh, but might also still be real because Mary Shelley specifically wrote that Frankenstein, the monster, is, is built in a scientific way. There's no ghost involved, there's no phantom, there's nothing supernatural there, right? So uh, a lot of scholars see, in fact, see Frankenstein as the start of sci-fi, one of the very most early sci-fi stories. Gravity, however, does not contain any nova. There's nothing there which is new, which is a point of difference from the world as we know it. There's nothing there which is estranging in that sense, nor speculative, right? The Hubble Space Telescope is very real, so is space debris, so is crashes between these things. This is a, a drama set in space, but not science fiction. So the Novum. The Novum seems to be an, an, an awesome little thing that we can, we can look at because it talks about what sci-fi does, right? Not necessarily about what it is, but what it does. And on the basis of that, we can look at um, the potential of science fiction as well. Because the Nova, if it is speculative, plausible, yet estranging, that of course lends itself very well to prediction, right? And it's like a classic trope that sci-fi predicts all sort of, um, of, uh, of phenomena that later happen, right? So uh, Jules Verne, classic, right? Same man who wrote um, Around the World in 80 Days and uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He also wrote From the Earth to the Moon in 1865. And um, it's the first moon landing in fiction ever written. Apparently they smoke cigars on the moon once, once they get there. But, right? And so uh, 100 years later, of course, the Apollo 11 mission, they went, <coughs> went to the moon. A bit different than Verne predicted. He thought we would shoot a train into space. Nevertheless, we landed on the moon, right? Correct prediction. Gern's back. It's uh, a classic in what they call the golden age of sci-fi. So in this story, Rolf, first of all, we see him, uh, we see some sort of, I don't know, Skype, right? Retro Skype, something like that. But uh, it is also contains a description. This is in fact a, uh, a, a diagram that's in the original uh, publication of polarized wave apparatus sending waves to a space flyer, right? A spaceship, and that's then knocked back into this actinoscope that can then measure where the space flyer is relative to the wave apparatus, that's a radar, right? That's a radar, so that's 
well, the radar was, 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 was mostly innovated in the first world war and really started being used in the form that we know it now in the second world war. So, correct prediction. Well done, Gunsrek. Aldous Huxley. We know Aldous Huxley, right? Brave New World. By the way, Margaret Atwood um, reviewing it as a masterpiece of speculation, right? We're on the right track here, speculation. Um, contains, of course, Soma, the drug that everybody takes to, uh, to be happy. I don't know how many tons of like Prozac and Xanax and that sort of stuff are, are sold every day, but that started happening in the 50s and the 60s mostly. So once again, 30, days, 30 years prior or so, correct prediction. Heinlein, Robert Heinlein, Starship Troopers, made into an awesome movie as well by uh, Paul Verhoeven in the 90s. Yeah, it's a good watch, very nice. Lots of alien blood and all that, it's great. Also talked about um, uh, exosuits or power armor. So you have these marines and they go into, into an alien world and they have this sort of extra suit around them that makes them stronger, makes them carry more weight, makes them able to kill a lot of alien bugs, right? It's very real research being done right now. This is by Lockheed Martin in exosuits, right? So uh, this man is carrying, I don't know how many hundreds of kilos of weight. He's still able to push up. I think it's cheating. Nevertheless, that's a correct prediction, yeah? Arthur C. Clarke, Rendezvous with Rama, talks about a, um, you have a, 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 a um, telescope array on the Earth called the Space Guard that monitor near-Earth objects to make sure that um, we're not surprised by an asteroid that suddenly crashes into the Earth or whatever. Right? The Space Guard instead finds an alien spaceship, that thing, and they go and explore it. Right? Space Guard, they call it. It's the actual Space Guard founded in the 90s in the south of the UK that's monitoring the near Earth for objects that might crash into us. It's called after the Space Guard in Clark's book. Right? So prediction. It seems to be that the novum, this new thing, this point of difference, right, which is estranging yet plausible, lends itself to the pr prediction of things that then actually turn out to happen in the real world. Right? I'm not interested in that. <laughs> I don't find that very useful. I find it pretty lame. I think there's this, it's a bunch of, right, this is older sci-fi, a bunch of white men telling other white men that they might be correct in the future and then they turn out to be in and they say, woo, hey, we were right, right? I don't think that's, that's very, I think you waste the potential of the novum in that, right? This novum which is estranging and which, yet, which is plausible. So I think you waste the potential. Furthermore, as often as they are right in predicting things, they are wrong, right? And for me, that is flying cars. Right? How many flying cars have you seen in sci-fi? How many flying cars have you seen in real life? Yeah, are they happening anytime soon? No, because it's very <laughs> impractical, I think. So we have the novum. We have this awesome definition of what sci-fi can do and what makes sci-fi uh, different from other uh, forms of narrative, in our case. Yet this novum, uh, it, it gives us the potential to predict, yet this prediction seems to be not all that, right? So what do we do then? Let's, let's, let's take a closer look at the novum and let's get to, to the heart of some of the things I'm trying to say, right? So if we go back to, uh, to what uh, Roberts called science fiction, an encounter with difference. And so that works on that sort of first axis of the novum, which is estrangement. Because that means that the novum in sci-fi can show us something which is slightly different from our daily lives Yet we do recognize in a way, right? It's like, hey, something in there. This, is, this seems familiar to me, but in a, in a weird way, in an estranged way. Sixerce Rene, which is also is, is a Marxist sci-fi scholar, has called this defamiliarization. Right? So we have, a, we have a phenomenon in real life. And in sci-fi, it is presented to us as a novum, but it's actually, it's actually talking about the thing that we already have in real life. Right? But it defamiliarizes it in such a way that we can start thinking new things about that. And uh, Sixerne René says there's two ways of doing that. The first is by extrapolation. We extrapolate a known phenomenon into a novum. So ex taking it to its logical extreme, most often, right? Or projecting it into the future. What if we keep on doing this, then what happens? Or by displacing it. So taking something we know and then putting it on something very strange, putting it on a novum, putting it on an alien, putting it on a whatever, right? Seems a bit abstract. So. Uh, let's take a look at that, right? We all know surveillance. We know Big Brother is watching us, right? We know that's true. 
you extrapolate that to its logical extreme, and before you know it, you're in 1984. Yeah, it's no, no coincidence that we call these technologies Aurelian as a result. Extrapolation. So, and we might not think too much about surveillance in our daily lives, but if we extrapolate it in science fiction, we start thinking like, hey, maybe it's not such a great idea, right? It defamiliarizes surveillance in our daily lives, blows it up, extrapolates it, and then we can start thinking about it. <coughs> Displacement, right? Frank Herbert, Dune, was written in 65, also came out as a great movie by Denis Villeneuve last year, I believe, in which a bunch of people who look like this and who have first names like Paul go to a planet with uh, a lot of military might and all that, right? A planet which is entirely a sand planet. Uh, on that planet live people like that, and they go there to get a very, very valuable material that enables interstellar travel. So what are we talking about here, right? Are we talking about Dune? Are we talking about the Spice Melange? Are we talking about Space Flight? Or are we talking about oil? Right? Displacement. By way of the Novum, something that is familiar to us, so familiar in fact that often we cannot think about it, by displacing it, it becomes more tangible for us to think about. Right? So that is the first axis of the Novum, estrangement, that I believe is wasted in prediction. But it is very interesting in other strands of sci-fi. And that's the thing I want to point your attention to first, estrangement. Roberts even says that because of this, this axis of estrangement, that specific science fiction nova are more than just gimmicks, more than just cliches. They provide a symbolic grammar for articulating the perspectives of normally marginalized discourses of race, of gender, non-conformism, and alternative ideologies. We might think of this as the progressive or radical potential of science fiction. Right? It's very hard to talk about some things, but if these things are all of a sudden aliens, then we can talk about them. Right? Let's look at some, uh, some examples of this. Let's see if this is real. Let's see if this, this estrangement part of the novum actually gives us something useful. Right? Because it will mean that we can use science fiction as a critique, a critique of current things, right? a critique of current power structures or whatever that may be wrong, but is, are very hard for us to talk about unless we def defamiliarize them. Well, for example, Lord of the Worlds, the original by, uh, by Wells. Most people are familiar with um, the later one by Orson Welles, I believe, which is set in California. The original is set in uh, Victorian England at the time when uh, the British Empire was at its height and was using, uh, well, <laughs> amongst other things, was using uh, technological superiority to, to, to colonize half of the world, right? And why are the worlds, a technological superior Martians, come down from Mars and conquer Victorian London? And then there's a passage at one point in Wilder Worlds in which Wells says, well, if we think that the Martians are doing this to us and that's, that's bad, then what's up with the colonies, right? Displacing. Herland is a classical feminist uh, science fiction. Uh, there's a novum, which is the fact that women uh, can reproduce without men, create a beautiful utopia. A couple of men come into Herland, right? mess everything up, of course, but it's projected as a sort of, hey, what if women had suffrage? Right? What if we could say something? What would our society look like? Extrapolation. RUR is a, uh, is a play in the 1920s, a Czech play, coined the term robot. It's the first time the term robot came up. And uh, they invent a bunch of robots and they um, have to do all hard labor in society. These robots, they rise up, of course, revolution, that whole story, right? So we see here that by, by, by way of, of metaphor, by extrapolating or by displacing, we can critique things that otherwise we might not be able to see by def defamiliarizing them, by placing them on a novum, right? Estrangement. So that gives us the, the potential of science fiction as critique. This is Solaris, which is a, which is a classic of sci-fi in which a character says at some point, we don't want to conquer the cosmos, we simply want to extend the boundaries of Earth to the frontiers of the cosmos. For us, such and such a planet is as arid as the Sahara, another as frozen as the North Pole, yet another as lush as the Amazon basin. We are only seeking man. We have no need of other worlds. We need mirrors. And so that's the first potential I see in science fiction. 
can mirror these things to us, right? By placing them on an alien, on a robot, <laughs> or by projecting a feminist utopia. So science fiction is critique, right? It works by way, by way of metaphor. I think this one is very clear, right? Futurama is not about the future. Right? It's about the right now. But by way of a metaphor, by displacing things in a futuristic sort of environment, it critiques stuff in the now, in the here and the now. So in that sense, the novum can function as a metaphor for our own time. And in that sense, uh, as, a, as a critic, I really like. It's not uses sci-fi, but it's actually into uh, feminist science fiction scholars. She says that science fiction points at an absent but possible other present. Right? Try to let that sink in for a, bit, for a minute. By critiquing those things right now that we are very hard to see, displacing them onto a novum, we are actually thinking about how our current present could be different. Right? And so that often, in this case of the novum, it functions as a metaphor. Forcing robots to work for us is like oppression of the proletariat, right? So referring to uh, RUR, that, uh, the theater play I just showed you. The novum as a metaphor. Forcing robots to work for us is like the oppression of the proletariat, right? So in its, in its, in its functioning, this metaphor, it's the same like man is like a wolf. A is like B, right? Metaphor. Now, if you want to think about metaphor, you can always turn to this man, who is uh, Paul Ricoeur, who in 2003 wrote a massive tome on, uh, on metaphor. It's called The Use of Metaphor, but it's really like, it's, it's a massive book. And he has some interesting things to say about metaphor, right? So what this guy claims, if you look at Man is Like a Wolf, he says, the system of implications does not remain unchanged by the action of the metaphorical utterance. To apply the system is to contribute at the same time to its determination. The wolf appears more human at the moment than by calling the man a wolf and places the man in a special light. <coughs> now that's interesting, right? I think you see his point, right? Man is like a wolf, does not only do, not only man is modified by the statement, but so is the wolf. Of course, means that by forcing robots to do work for us, if that is like the oppression of the proletariat, then these two things also interact in certain ways. The metaphor, in some way, not only is a figure of speech in a non-existing world, but it also has an actual feedback on reality. Now, what does that mean, right? Well, Yes, so it seems to imply that there's something more to the novum. Right? If the novum is a metaphor that we can use to criticize uh, our current conditions, perhaps there's something more to the novum, right? If a metaphor also changes the system of implications, does it also shape the way in which we perceive reality? And that's an interesting thought, right? So not only critique stuff, but it can also change the way we perceive that stuff. I'm really singing the praises of science fiction here, right? And I think it's good to sometimes take a step back and say, like, oh, is that is that really the case, right? Can, is the novum really capable of this? You know, because we also have di we also have this sort of stuff, right? Man finally created a machine with feelings. Was the author really mostly concerned with feelings or something else, right? Galaxina, this sort of stuff. Is this really is this really something that you know changes the way we perceive reality? Is Ricoeur, does he have, is, is he correct? Does he make any sense, right? What's up with the flying cars? If it's true that the metaphor also changes reality, what's up with that, right? Well, I think he does have a point. I, have a point. I think he does have a point. Because I think that with these flying cars, <laughs> even though they don't exist, nor probably ever will, if they happen, it will be because some guy read a lot of sci-fi and figured like, hey, I want to make a flying car, right? If flying cars happen, then I know what the headline on the newspapers will be like. The future is here, right? If we get flying cars, this is what the newspapers will say. And so that means 
Not so much that this, this, this changing of reality by the metaphor, right? It means that the way we perceive stuff. We now, the novum, the flying car, the novum of the flying car is a metaphor for the future itself. Any, any narrative in which you will find flying cars, you know, haha, that's the future. Right? But it also means that we now think something else about the future than in a world in which we never had thought of flying cars in the first place. Right? Strange, strange. Need some more, uh, some more, some more plucking apart. So for that, I want to return to Darko and look at the second, the second axis of the novum, which is speculation. Right? So we go back to, uh, to Darko's uh, definition. Right? The novum, an estranging yet plausible narrative mechanism. And that makes SF an encounter with difference, right? We remember. So the estranging part we looked at, we didn't look at the plausible part yet. The plausible part I connect to what I call speculation, right? That means not wild speculation, but it means something that may come true. That is, per definition, not true right now, but may come true. It's grounded in some, some sort of, 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 of plausible, as he calls it, future. So what does that mean, right? Well, the flying cars, for example, it's not about the cars could be real. It's not about the prediction part, right? As I said, I don't care about that. But it's about the fact that we can now speculate about flying cars in the first place. Yeah? So the novum shakes something up in our thinking. In fact, in some ways, this, this speculative part of the novum, uh, next to the estranging, we're talking about the speculative part now, it enables new ways of thinking. It enables thinking there where previously, previously you could not. It opens up your thinking. Right? And sometimes that's about aliens and laser guns. And sometimes that's about something more. Right? And then, because of the metaphor, also affecting reality, as per Paul Ricoeur, that also influences what we can think in the first place. So in this respect, speculation is a critical gesture that shapes the way we perceive reality and envision our future. That's my take on speculation. But is that so, right? Invaders from Mars. <coughs> awesome. This is an awesome little bit of trivia. This uh, is the, um, uh, the first uh, colorized sci-fi movie, or at least like sci-fi as in aliens and, and death beams and all that, right? Came out in 1953. Uh, its plot has there's a bunch of alien abductions first before the aliens before the Martians invade Earth. Why is that? We have to probe some, probe some things and uh, gather some intel and all that. The funny thing is, <laughs> I'm not. Nobody knows, nor do I, where it is entirely this movie. But alien abduction stories only start happening since after this movie came out. Before very similar stories came out, right? But it was mostly had to do with. Um, uh, religious appearances, that sort of stuff, right? Uh, meeting cryptids, right? Sasquatch, but not a great alien, right? Ever since this movie came out, alien abduction stories are massive. So this does seem to shape the way we perceive reality, right? William Gibson, Neuromancer. It's a very cool book. It came out in 1984. It's so generally seen to be the start of the, the cyberpunk genre, as they call it. Some of you might know the game as well, right? Everything is shit, everything is edgy. But uh, what's also especially um, important about this book is that he coined the term cyberspace. So the idea was you have hackers and they plug themselves into a machine and then a, a, a part of them, or at least a digital version of them, is actually is in the machine. These versions of themselves, they, 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 they look like a certain way, right? You can program what you look like yourself in cyberspace. So first of all, this book not only coined the term cyberspace, but it also sort of came up with the idea of an avatar. Right? Second Life, I don't know if you know the game. Yeah? The metaverse is this. This is the metaverse. Hopefully just less shitty, because this is really, it's very, quite, quite post-apocalyptic, this book. So this also seems to, seems to shape how we think about us in, cyber, in cyberspace, in digital space in the first place, right? Us as little walking avatars with a funny hat on, this book, right? Isaac is a, is a classic, of course, in, uh, in sci-fi. Jokester is a, is a little known story, however. It's about a bunch of people who have to escape from an uh, artificial in, 
well, reality, from a stimulated reality, right? Which uh, influenced a lot of people, of course. Simulated realities. We have Philip K. Dick. We can remember it for you wholesale about a man who was not quite sure whether he, meant to war, uh, whether he went to Mars or didn't, because was that an artificial memory implanted in his brain or not? I was adapted into a fantastic Schwarzenegger movie, which you should absolutely watch if you haven't. <coughs> was a massive influence on The Matrix. Right? The Matrix, of course, there's an entire simulated reality in which people live. And you know, do you wake up, do you take the red pill, or do you not? Which, in turn, all of these books and movies before that influenced the uh, Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom, who took away the, we can save you from the stimulated reality part, and says, well, maybe that's all we are. Maybe we're just in a simulated reality. Maybe we are simulations too. Simulation theory, which from there, of course, was picked up by some people, by a certain man who may or may not own Twitter, and God knows where it goes from there, right? But simulated reality started with Isaac Asimov. So my claim being that it does shape the way we perceive reality. By way of the metaphor, by way of the second axis of the novum, which is about speculation. And that is where my, my, my claims uh, come together, because you have these two axes, right? We have the estrangement axis, right? Which uh, is about our present, our current presence, and, and, and enables us to critique that current presence by saying that uh, unoppressed group are like robots, and these robots are oppressed. Hey, what about their own world, right? And we have the second axis of speculation, which shapes our, our perception of reality, but also of what is or is not possible in the future, right? So that talks about the future. That is why I think the novum, as proposed by Darko Suvin, is so great. However, he, <laughs> I, I, I think, right, I maintain that uh, he falls short of like looking at what happens if you do these things at the same time. What happens if the novum does both of these things? Right? What happens at, on the knife point of a combination between estrangement and speculation? Because that is what sci-fi can do. Right? In fact, according to Suvin, that is what makes sci-fi unique as opposed to fantasy, for example, which is not plausible, but is estranging. Right? So I think that if you combine these two, you can make science fiction, potentially, liberatory. Right? Because it makes it able to reimagine the present by imagining other realities. Right? Is the novum a strange and critiques our current present? And speculation of the novum also shapes our perception and our vision of the future. That means that sci-fi can help us rethink our present, reshape our reality, our perception of reality of the present, and enable other visions of what the future may be. And that's pretty crazy. Xiao Yong Chu, therefore called science fiction high intensity realism. She's got a lot of shit for that because if, it's, if science fiction is not, if there's one thing that science fiction is not, it's realism, most popular people seem to think, right? She says, no, it's high intensity realism. Science fiction is able to represent things real things that realism cannot, right? And that is utter presence, to shape our reality, right? So I believe that this encounter with difference, as science fiction was called by Adam Roberts again, this is science fiction to me. The encounter with difference that enables us to think beyond the status quo. That only enables us to shake it up, as critique can, it also enables us in the, same, in the same movement to envision other realities. And in that sense, I call it liberatory. First of all, because it's liberatory for thought, right? Make sure that we can think about stuff beyond our usual thinking. And it can potentially <laughs> be liberatory also for, in, in a political sense, in a social sense, in a cultural sense. That's a big claim, right? So what do we do with that? Right? What does sci-fi look like if that is what it does? Well, uh, this is the point where I just started listing my favorites, right? Star Trek, still going strong, still being absolutely awesome, right? Basically a bunch of communists in space working together to beat the odds. 
fantastic. Both estranging, communism doesn't work like that in our, in our own world, right? And brings a shitload of novums to help you create that vision, right? Ursula Le Guin, who is an amazing, an amazing author. Uh, two of her most well-known science fiction books. We have uh, The Left Hand of Darkness is the one on the right. It's about a man, a male man, who lands on a planet in which uh, everybody is genderless, with the exception of, I think, four days in the month. Right? This man is freaked out, of course, right? He doesn't know how to deal with these people. It also happens to be that he's an ambassador from another race, so he has to. Fantastic. The Dispossessed is about two planets that orbit each other. The one is a capitalist uh, society, the other one is an anarcho-syndicalist society. One man goes back and forth, what happens, right? And the, both the, they're also combined with beautiful character studies. They're just beautiful books in their own terms. That uh, estranges and that speculates, right? That helps us to think beyond our usual conception of gender, of, our, of, of what we think that uh, is capitalism the, the end of Western society or not, those sort of things, right? And you're reading a very nice book. That's good stuff, right? Octavia Butler, Lilith's Brood, about um, a woman who was kidnapped by aliens. Who, um, these aliens, they have to use genes from other species to reproduce. It really reconsiders race and the way we think of race, especially in a biological way. Ian Banks, again, space communists, but this time with very massive weapons as well, right? And how did they maintain their little communist hippie utopia in the future? They have to get their hands very dirty, right? Spoiler. Makes it for fantastic reading. Ted Chiang, top left. Story of your life. About a woman who uh, is exposed to an alien language, which leads her to perceive time as happening simultaneously instead of linearly. That has massive consequences for ethics, for how she relates herself to her daughter, to how she relates herself to politics. Was adapted by Denis Villeneuve as a rival, also a fantastic film. Kazuo Ishiguro, never let me go. What if, um, what if we do get clones? Clones are awesome, especially for their organs. But what do the clones think of that, right? Written from the perspective of the clones. Paolo Bagigalupi is American, the wind-up girl. Book about uh, set in Thailand after uh, ecological disaster, right? Climate crisis, massive climate crisis. Thailand is the only country that somehow managed to stay upright in all this. Eh? And you get eco terrorists and agri conglomerates and all that sort of stuff trying to figure out what Thailand is doing, what they did wrong. It reads like a like a like a thriller, right? Like sort of crime detective sort of th thriller. It is about our current relationship to the natural world and also to our current ecological treatment of what we call third world countries, right? Is it okay to ship our trash off to Thailand or Malaysia? Black Mirror, right? You just talked about these two qualities of the Novum, estrangement and speculation, Black Mirror, right? Ex Machina, fantastic movie as well, it's by Alice Garland. What if we start Turing testing, but the, uh, the, the, the machine we're Turing testing is actually intelligent? What does the machine think of that? Right? And so these sort of things is what sci-fi can do. And I maintain that that is because of this combination of these two qualities of the novum. Estrangement on the one hand and speculation on the other hand. And if we combine these two, then not all sci-fi, not all sci-fi, but a certain way of doing sci-fi has liberatory potential. Right? Liberatory potential because it opens up our thinking and because it can, it can critique, but also envision alternatives to stuff that is just wrong right now. And what does that have to do with you? So this is a bit of a rhetorical uh, title, I'll have to give you that, right? Like embracing your inner nerd. I mostly mean read sci-fi, <laughs> right? <laughs> Go for it. But also take it seriously. Yeah? Take it seriously. It's genre fiction. And often it's seen as, 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 as pulpy. It often is, right? It often is. But there's also forms of sci-fi that are not pulpy. And I believe that few fictional genres hold that same liberatory potential, exactly because of the novum, right? Exactly because what I hoped I just told you, like just communicated to you. Um, or at least, right, are inclined towards this potential. So like I see 
It's not that other genres would not be able to do this, but sci-fi is like loaded dice, right? You roll them and it's, you're more likely to get this potential. Connected to that, of course, I plead to also take seriously estrangement and speculation as literary and as critical modes, as a way of thinking right? and as a way of interrogating the world, and to take seriously your own imagination. Yes, do note that all of this stuff, all of these novums, right, they're points of difference. They're fundamentally not possible if you lose sight of your imagination. Take that seriously, right? Do not be, do not scoff towards non-realist modes of thinking or of telling a narrative, right? Take that seriously. Next to that, science fiction is genre fiction. I started off with that, right, which means it's mostly a bunch of nerds. It's not very big. It's pretty hard to make good money off of it, which means that it needs its creators, its fans, and its scholars, right? So if you have a little bit of a heart for this, then pay for your book, right? Go see that movie. It's important. The genre needs it. The genre really, it's like liking metal bands, you know? Like, pay that CD, right? Otherwise, they'll just have to stop. And finally, science fiction, right? Sort of tying all these things up. As a speculative genre, it needs imaginative people, which means that, yes, embrace your inner nerd, right? Do not be afraid to be imaginative. The genre needs it. I think thinking needs it as well. Your reading could use a little of it, perhaps, right? Your writing, too. Sci-fi is what we need. Sci-fi we should take seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martijn. Um, we may have time for some questions. Is there someone who has a question for Martijn? Yeah. I'll use, please use the mic because we're recording this. Of course. Um, so you cite sort of these various ideas that, that sort of turned into progress, which is uh, sort of in scientific progress uh, and these ideas of, of science fiction as, as a positive driving force that's liberatory uh, socially and technologically. But then there's also considerations to make about, of course, some of the works that you cite, of course, are dystopic scientific works, and they drive uh, humanity in directions where uh, we sort of, before, at least in these uh, liberal, neoliberal institutions, sort of don't necessarily want. So there's also these ideas uh, coming out of Warwick in the late 90s from uh, CCRU. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. No. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a, a research unit of philosophy students, and they come up with the idea of hyperstition, whereby ideas come from science fiction or come into conception through human imagination and then through their introduction into a common literary stream they become inevitable as driving forces for thoughts and progress and developments of ideas mm -hmm. so of course maybe not flying cars quite yet hopefully never uh looking at how uh, say people drive but uh then this idea of progress, which is inevitably driving itself and then if you connect it to the ideas of certain philosophers on uh you know Regressionism in, in, in these conceptions of agrarian society where they find sort of a Malthusian tipping points mm -hmm. in technology. Uh, so, so in industrial societies, Ted Kaczynski talks about a point whereby the damage to society becomes so insurmountable where there is a, a point of no return. And then you reach current talkings. I, I was recently reading an article about a, a professor from UC Berkeley who discusses, for example, blockchain technology and the idea of, of, of how you know some people conceptualize it as progressive, especially saying, well, there's such energy demand that we must turn to green energy. And then the critique, of the, the critique of this is essentially we're just holding progress together by holding a gun to it and saying, well, we have to. Mm. Uh, and this inevitability that we have to process through. So is it always necessarily a positive change forward for technology, science fiction, and the human imagination? Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I don't think that progress is an inevitable, especially technological process, right? That's a frame that we give it, and often that's misused. So I do have a philosophical qualm already with that first premise, right? It's not, it's what we make of it, it's what we do. You know, technology is not going to progress itself if we don't make it in the first place. Secondly, uh, you are right, though. I mean, like I showed Starship uh, Troopers, for example, before, Heinlein, right? Man was a convinced fascist. The book also talks about you only get voting rights uh, if you uh, have done military service, for example. However, that movie that Paul Verhoeven made out of it, that I talked about before earlier as well, 
Paul Verhoeven grew up under Nazi uh, occupation in the Netherlands. He made a massive satire out of it. Right? And all the, all the intelligence officers in the movie, they walk around in Gestapo uh, outfits and all that. So the point is there that both of them uh, ended up using their imagination. And I think it's also, like I said, also take yourself seriously, perhaps not only as a scholar of and as a producer of, but also as a reader of sci-fi. And also you use your imagination, right? It's not a sort of strap yourselves in and sit back and just go for the, for the ride. It's an active process of speculating and of estranging. So yes, this progress can go in multiple ways and we should be on the outlook for it. But it, I think it can also be self-reflective in such a way that progress can in fact be interrogated by estrangement, by speculation, right? So, but we do need to be on our guard to keep these things happening. You're very right, you're very true. Also, the, the Galaxina thing that I showed, right? The feeling robot, yeah, that's not, that's not, right? So hence, I've been stressing for potentially and for certain forms of sci-fi do this, but I do believe it, it, it has an inherent uh, capability of doing that because of this self-reflexive uh, part of imagination, right? And also, hence, take yourself seriously. Take sci-fi seriously, take us seriously. These ideas are not just, right? I've argued for that, these ideas are not just ideas. Does that sort of engage with? Yeah, <laughs> all right, thank you. I see another question. Up here. Uh, well, thank you so much for this lovely uh, lecture, last lecture. I'm quite new to sci-fi actually, so I was wondering, because you said estrangement and speculation as present and future, what do you think about the past? Is there something that sci-fi can play in the past? Did we imagine the Renaissance and we were plugged in during that time or something like that? Do you think the past can play a role? It's uh, a good question, thank you. You have, you have alternative history, right? Which is often seen as also part of, uh, of sci-fi. I think uh, The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick is the biggest, the most well-known example of that. And um, so it depends on is there this novum still? Is there still this point of difference? And often you'll see that like in these alternative um, histories, um, the Nazis have won the war, right? That's Philip K. Dick, that's the man in the high castle. And then that, of course, also creates a world, a different world from ours, which is both estranging yet plausible. So yes, it can work in the past. It's not the most seen genre, or subgenre of sci-fi, let's say, but it, it definitely can work that way, yes. Any more? Um, when a novum is not like important, like a flying car, but still can shape our prediction of the future, can this also be called f um, fantasy? All right. So if I understand, well, n no, no. So the, the n <laughs> by 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 definition, right? So the novum um, has to be uh, estranging yet plausible, and that is what makes it a novum. And so that's also why an orc is not an ovum, most classically seen, because an orc is not plausible, right? And so that's in, at least in Darko Suvin's, uh, right? So also the, yeah, the whole novum theory is also what demarcates science fiction from fantasy. Now you have, of course, an enormous amount of fiction that is exactly entirely on that border there. So to sh too sharply demarcate, as I said, I don't think that's good. I think that also goes against the spirit of what I've been trying to say here, All right? So at some point, you're free to call something with an orc who's using a laser gun science fiction, right? Sure, go ahead. And in fact, there might be some very interesting thinking to be done with an orc with a laser gun, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Uh, you always stress plausibility, but where, where would we draw the line? Where would you decide when something is plausible and when it isn't? Yes, very good question. Critical question, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really. Depends on your imagination as well, right? What do you think? You kept stressing being imaginative, but then you said an orc is impossible. But you know, if you're imaginative enough, maybe you could. You should write a book, <laughs> right? No, I think I th you, you're right. So, but once again, so this, like I said, I, d I do not want to argue for too stringent of definitions because I think that sort of collapses the whole idea in the first place, right? And it's a fact that in these sort of gray areas is where some very good thinking can be done, is done, will be done. And so the plausibility of it is mostly that um, you have this <laughs> very old discussion of is Star Wars, is that sci-fi or not, right? And a lot of people say like, well, this stuff isn't explained. It's not plausible, right? It's a, a lightsaber, it's a light sword, but nobody's telling me how this is working and hence it's not plausible. And so people say that is not sci-fi, right? 
I'm on the fence. I think there's plenty of novums in there, depending on how imaginative you are, how plausible you do find it or do not find it. Maybe sci-fi as well, right? Might be a perfectly working novum for you. So I don't, I don't want to be too stringent on these things, but use them more as a sort of a initial guiding rule, right? What is important is what the novum does. Estranging and speculation, and not so much, is this a novum or is it not? Does that answer your question? All right, thank you. I see one more question. That I think that's the last one because we have to wrap it up. <laughs> but energy ran into a problem that you're using this tool only to look back at what was in, like you know, um, speculative, engaging, etc., and then from you know from back from the end too, you project the means of this is novel enough. Uh, well, oh yeah. Uh, this has done this effect of how it's now in the sense of, you know, okay, if you have this tool and all, you know, the effects that it engages you with uh, the literature feel really real to you, etc. But then, you know, when you look back, we cannot say, oh yeah, this is, spe this is specifically, you know, uh, the snuff as a tool and then working with it in the sense of like, you know, really thinking of, um, yes, this works as it is, then, yeah, don't you run into the problem of basically, you know, looking back and say, and just basically for being very selective about it. I'm not sure I entirely understand. Could you, could you repeat like the, the gist of the question? Uh, so basically my question is rather, okay, if you, well, if you posit this as Novum, et cetera, don't you then run into problems of that, okay, no, Novum, is produces these effects, but when these effects basically, you know, research, etc., uh, or you basically read re literature and then they unfold themselves in front of you, then you run into the problem that basically you only see those effects in a sense and then look back in order to see the novum, or don't you have any other better criteria in establishing the novum as well, not just only this thing that does these effects, but also like, you know, this is a mechanism that works within the sci-fi like i think it's more and more the latter yeah it's not necessarily about looking back right it's also looking at the present it's more and so this novum can change over time as well because what is plausible at one point might not be in the other so once again i i, I like to stress that the novum i find that so importantly because it looks at what it does and so in these terms i'm as much arguing for um uh, speculation and uh, estrangement as a uh, frames of thinking right as much as the specificity of the novum i think it finds a very uh, right, a very palpable, a very useful form in sci-fi. Right, it's like these 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 very critical and imaginative ways of thinking with laser guns. So, which makes it better for me, but also more accessible to a lot of people, I believe, and uh, easier to think with in the first place. Right, because it's less dry and it's more imaginative, and so that can help people to pick up these nova rather than read the cur. Right, does that answer your question? <laughs> All right, thank you.